Canadians often look at the United States for obvious reasons. You want to do the there are a number of ways that you can go in there and you want to do that tax efficiently, but you don't want to jump out of the Canadian pot, tax pot into the U.S. fire. So here we go. I'm super excited to have our guest on today. His name is David Lesperance. Hopefully I, I pronounce it properly. I kind of gave it a kind of a French touch there. And he's a global immigration and tax advisor. I think the cool thing here is Dave and I have spoken um, uh, prior to this episode and, and once previously, and he has such a wealth of knowledge in this particular space. And I can very definitely say that I have not had this level of expertise in terms of the conversations. So I'm super excited because I think there's a lot of people out there who are successful or aspiring to be successful that can use your knowledge, David. So thank you for joining us here today. Thank you, Derpy. My, uh, my pleasure. So, David, how did you get into, if you can give us a quick two-minute rundown in terms of how you got into what you're doing right now? Sure. I uh, grew up in Windsor. Um, father would wake up in Canada, go work in the U.S., so very familiar with Canada-U.S. issues uh, from a early childhood. What was quite common back then was mothers would run over to Henry Ford Hospital and have... Uh, what they now call anchor babies. And so you know about citizenship-based taxation in the United States. Um, fast forward, needed a job going through law school, worked at the Winter Detroit Tunnel uh, at, the, at the, the booth saying hello to people. <laughs> Saw the immigration people with their feet up reading the newspaper, and I thought that would be the job for me. And then moved to uh, we moved to Toronto, did the same job at Pearson, never thinking I was going to actually do this. It was just a great job going through law school. Got called to the bar in 1990, um, and three things happened. One, my law school study partner went to move to Hong Kong, and that was prior to the 97 handover, so I've been dealing with Hong Kong and China clients. Canada had a program called the Immigrant Investor Program, kind of a golden visa program, and I was running up and down the, the Gulf meeting Standard Charter and HSBC private clients, and I did my first U.S. expatriation because the U.S. has this unique citizenship-based taxation. Other countries like Canada say, if you're resident here, maybe on a day count or on a connection test, you're a taxpayer. The United States says, if you're a, a U.S. citizen, even if you got that citizenship through a parent and have never stepped foot in the United States, you're a U.S. person for tax purposes. And Canada uh, uh, also doesn't tax base purely on permanent residence, whereas the United States says the moment you have a green card, uh, you are a U.S. taxpayer, and just because that green card expired doesn't mean you stop being a resident, an alien, or a taxpayer, just as your, when your passport doesn't ex expire, it doesn't mean you've lost your citizenship. So fast forward three decades, I basically, I'm a tax-savvy immigration advisor or an immigration-savvy tax advisor, and we look at, for, for business people and families, kind of how resident citizenship and domicile can protect them from increased taxation, litigation like family law, and sovereign risks. Um, they're worried about maybe the government or the society that they're in, and they want to pick up and have options and a backup plan. Yeah, I really like how you talked about the sovereign risk, because I think that's a, one of the biggest reasons why a lot of people, you can say international families and individuals invest in Canada, for example, because it seems you know pretty stable from that perspective. So I, I want to jump right into it here, David. So predominantly, our audience is in Canada and the U.S. Uh, and the U.S., and we have uh, an audience out in Europe as well and Australia. But let's just say, for the purposes of this conversation, if we focus on Canada and the U.S., we can always do other places after in another episode. But let's just say there's a successful business owner, a successful family, and they're looking to invest or put their money or park their money in another country, and possibly even maybe move there either full-time or part-time, what are the things that you would advise them to consider? Plus, are there any countries that are on your favorite list that you think would be the best option? Sure. So uh, Canadians often look at the United States for obvious reasons. You want to do, the, there are a number of ways that you can go in there and you want to do that tax efficiently, but you don't want to jump out of the Canadian pot, tax pot into the U.S. fire. Uh, so we look at that. Um, 
the we the North America, Canada, and the U.S. Those are immigration immigrant destination countries. So a lot of uh, people, up to you know, estimates of 40, 45 percent of people uh, in Canada and the U.S. will have claim to a lineage citizenship uh, from quote unquote the old country. And if that's in Europe, let's say they had an Irish grandmother or a, a, a Polish grandfather, doesn't mean they have to live in Ireland or Poland. In fact, under the Treaty of Rome, they can take that Polish citizenship and live in any one of 27 European countries. So there's a number of different kind of options. Really? And, and that's just by having a grandmother or something that's Polish? Each country is different. So you okay. have to look yeah. at what, what your family history is and what the what the relatives are. And, and Herdy, one other family kind of personal background thing was, I swear my siblings and I didn't go out nightclubbing looking for Europeans to dance with. But my sister married a Latvian, my brother married an Italian, I married a Scotswoman, then a Pole, and my younger sister married an Irishman. Now, I'm living now in Europe, and I'm the only one of the four of us, but I can tell you all of my nieces and nephews have done this. So getting that second citizenship is it's an insurance policy in case you want to leave where you're currently at for a variety of reasons, but it's also an opportunity for the next generations to do things such as study or move or job opportunities, et cetera. So we look at that. We look at, you know, different jurors. So Europe is very popular. We have some clients that go to places further afield like New Zealand and Australia. UK is very popular. Uh, Mexico and different parts of Latin America are popular. And we also have people from those jurisdictions who are also, for their own reasons, looking for, for backup plans. Hmm. Interesting. And so what are some of the, again, you talked about sovereign risk, you talked, so what kind of factors do you look at? Let's just say they're picking a place in South, South America somewhere. So we, we need to look at kind of what the family situation is. And I like to say, because oftentimes we're, we're moving just more than one individual, a single individual, we're moving a family. So it has to be a solution that they can sell at the breakfast table, that all the family members, and they may have different needs. Um, for example, we've got a South African family right now where the the parents um, want to leave South Africa because of different things going from, from load sharing brownouts to disintegrating the situ personal and, and social situation. But they don't, and the, the kids all say, I want to go into, their adult children all want to go into the United States, finally, but we don't want to expose the family well. So we're going to park the parents in Bermuda. They can have easy access in and out of the United States, but they're not going to become U.S., we're not going to subject the family well to, to U.S. taxation. The kids are going to live in the U.S., they're going to be taxpayers. Um, one is spouse is an airplane pilot. So we look at all the different elements and what's going to fit, you know, or do we have retirees? Do we have people that are starting their career? Do we have people who are uh, starting post-secondary school? Do we have young families that need to be somewhere for their children nine months of the year? We look at all those different elements. We look at kind of what their preferences are. And occasionally I'll have a client that will say, well, send me somewhere where there's no taxes and no lawyers that consume me. So, <laughs> fine. Um We'll, we'll move you to Pitcairn Island. Oh, well, the only 67 people on earth have decided that's where they want to live. Oh, no, no. I need schools. I need airport. I need plane access. I need this. It's like, okay, so what jurisdiction is going to work that is, is going to meet all the family needs? And interestingly, three quarters of the families we move are to what are thought of as high tax countries, but because of planning or particular regimes have a low tax burden. And so we don't generally, you know, a, a relatively small number of clients move to kind of Cayman Islands or, you know, Gibraltar or, you know, some of these other kind of what are thought of as traditional tax havens. Mm -hmm. They're usually places like Italy. Uh, Italy has a lump sum. Uh, the UK has something called the remittance basis. That's a number of jurisdictions. So a number of European jurisdictions have very favorable tax regimes. Some tax regimes are of, uh, uh, territorial tax, and we just, they don't have any local tax. They live off the capital that they bring from abroad. So it's a mix of lifestyle, personal security, what fits, you know, the family needs, family members' needs, and also let's do that in a tax-efficient manner. And we also want to be careful 
um, about uh, it's something that a lot of people overlook, which is divorce. I mm-hmm. mean, everybody who gets married thinks it's forever, and half of us are wrong. Mm-hmm. And you and your wife may be fine, but I have nine-year-old twins, so statistically, one of them is going to get divorced. So you want to be in a jurisdiction where, with proper planning, that's not going to eat into you know the family wealth. The family wealth that actually makes sense. Uh, and you said something that was actually very interesting. I never thought about it this way. It was actually quite br- brilliant. But you're talking about that Bermuda example, U.S. and Bermuda. You know, my my thought when when we were talking about moving a family went directly to okay, the family needs to be in the same country. And so not real, not even thinking past that that box to say, hey, look, you know, countries border all the time. You and in some places there's a lot of countries that surround a lot of countries, and so you can have a lot of options there. So I think that was a great great insight for me, and and hopefully for the for the audience as well. So thank you for sharing that. I'm going to ask you something uh, about your technical skills. How do you keep up to date with all of the tax knowledge for these countries? Because I've talked to accountants here in Canada, they can barely keep up with the Canadian laws, uh, the tax regulations. How do you do that from a global perspective? I spend probably about half of my day doing everything from Google alerts to a variety of of newspapers, and I interact with a lot of professionals. Uh, So today, for example, I was talking to uh, a UK accountant who's based in France about tax favorable regimes coming into France and Switzerland. Uh, I just, just before this call, I was talking with a Turkish tax lawyer about kind of what's the situation post Erdogan's uh, election. What's the what's the mood? What are people doing? What kind of what it's a foreign exchange risk? So there's a lot of time and interaction, and then really working with a lot of different clients. And what I do is I kind of operate at thirty thousand feet. So I've been doing this for three plus decades. I can kind of understand what the client needs are, be able to draw that out of them suggest some different jurisdictions, here's why it may work. And then we end up engaging specialists in each jurisdiction to kind of implement. So I act a bit like on a team of architects and then we hire, so for example, we're doing Americans right now going into Canada. Hmm. Well, if you're if you're young and have the right degrees and experience, you may be able to come under the express entry program where you're kind of riding on your you know, your, your, your points and your qualification. If you're a bit older, even if you're bilingual PhD in computer science, you're just not going to get enough points. You need to look at other ways, such as a startup visa. We're doing for a lot of Americans who are trying to, as a backup plan, Canada's close. They can stay in the same time zone. It's familiar to them. Um, and we're getting a multi-generational solution, kind of like a go bag option should whatever issue, whether it's taxation increases in the United States, whether it's they're, they're, they're worried about political situation, if the wrong party in their mind gets in, you know, they, they want to go, maybe they're worried about, you know, all kinds of different things. And so, you know, is Canada going to be the right solution for them? And, and then we do that. And then I engage local council in each one of the jurisdictions to kind of like build the house. So we design architectural model and then kind of project manage all of the the different contractors to build the particular elements of it. Mm, interesting. So where do you see, is there some common destinations where you see Canadians um, and Americans going outside of North America? Yeah, we're seeing a lot that are looking at, at Europe right now um, because a lot of these jurisdictions um, so people think you know, Europe is a high tax country. Well, you have to look at kind of you know, I'm going to throw one equation at your audience, which is X times Y equals Z or Z, depending on whether it's Canadian or American. X is the amount of taxable income. Y is the rate. Z, Z is dollars paid. Well, all the focus, President Biden was just talking about, oh, well, you know, the wealthy pay a different tax rate than police and nurses. Yes, but that's only part of the equation. Would you rather have, you know, the capital gain rate of on Warren Buffett's millions or the ordinary tax rate of his assistance, 60000 if you're trying to maximize, from the government's point of view, the amount of taxes paid? 
And so that's why you have, and it's just a fact, you may say it's fair or unfair, but fact is the top 1% in the United States contribute 43% of the personal tax take. And because the United States doesn't have a VAT tax, like most other developed countries, it has an extraordinary demand on, it has an extraordinary amount of its tax revenue comes from personal taxation. So if you run a business and 43% of your revenue comes from one out of 100 of your customers, you kind of want to know about those customers. And if you look at them and you say, well, that group are less likely to have to be in a specific place to make and maintain their wealth, they can remote work. They can do different things. So they're, quote unquote, not sticky. They can also hire people like me who can provide a number of different options. And so it's a, it's whether you think it's fair or not, it's a relatively unstable um, you know, business model, revenue model. And I, you know, I've been doing, only doing this for 33 years. I'm sure it'll happen someday, but I've yet to have a client that says, well, I'm not gonna leave because 75% of everybody else thinks I shouldn't go. No, I'm, I'm doing what I think is best for myself and my family. And that may not be because they want to have more money to spend on a car or a plane or a yacht. It may be because they have strategic philanthropy that they want to do. Maybe they want to keep a business going, then pass that on to children. They have legacies. They have different different reasons. And they say, well, I don't mind paying tax, but I've got a personally a limit as to what I what I think is fair. I don't care what everybody else thinks is fair. It's my perception of what is fair. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in a lot of jurisdictions now, when you do all the calculations and you actually look at the real numbers, you know, there's pretty significant tax revenue. And so that's kind of the driver. And so it's like, how do we move them somewhere where they get a, a they maintain that same lifestyle that they've enjoyed and all the family members get to do what they want and need to do, but you're doing that in a more tax efficient manner. And so you were saying Europe, so you, you already mentioned Italy, what other countries are you seeing? So, so in Europe, for example, Italy, Greece, and Spain, it's a lump sum. So whether you make a dollar or a hundred million, you write a check for a hundred thousand euros to the Italian government. That's it. Same thing in Greece. Hold on. In, you, it, whether you're making a dollar it's a lump sum. I'm agreeing to pay a hundred thousand euros a year in tax. And now, if you're paying a million somewhere else, that looks pretty good. Okay. The other thing is, you're not paying Price Waterhouse or Coopers or, or anybody else to do. There's no compliance cost. You're yeah. not worrying. Is this dinner, you know, an expensable? You know, how many miles? You have none of that compliance cost. You know that every year you're going to send them a hundred thousand, no matter what you make great. I get to live in Italy. Italy is also a jurisdiction with a bunch of tax treaties. So if I'm still doing stuff in the, in the country I left with or drawing income from there, I can take advantage of the Italian, Canada, Italian, U.S. tax treaty to reduce the taxes that Canada or the U.S. are going to take from that Canada or U.S. source income. Uh, the United Arab Emirates is, is another popular jurisdiction these days. They have a bunch of tax treaties. So the normal 30% withholding rate is 5% if you do it properly. Well, that's pretty good. Um, and there's no local tax. So if your tax burden moved from 30, 40, 50% to global tax burden of 5%, that's a lot closer to gross. Yeah, that pays, that pays for your living right there. And I think that's one of the appealing things for people that are thinking of moving. And I, I see that a lot in, in the U.S. itself is because of the tax differences. People will just move to another state and mm -hmm. save a lot of money on just the taxes and that pays for their lifestyle. And, and so that's, that's really interesting. So I want to come back to Italy and Greece and the lump sum uh, part because I wasn't aware of that. That's, that's something totally new to me. So I appreciate you educating me on that. But how does the average person who lives there, who isn't making 100,000 euros, pay for that tax bill then? So they, they will get, un so you have, so Italy is, a, is interesting in the, a, as a jurisdiction. So it has the lump sum option. It has the normal Italian tax rates that a normal Italian pays. They also have reduced tax rates 
in particular jurisdictions like in Sicily and Calabria and, and other jurisdictions, which don't traditionally get places like in the industrial north. They're trying to drive people there. So the, the way they do that is by giving them lower tax rates. Okay. So if you're a digital nomad, for example, and you say, okay, I want to, I can buy property there. I don't, if I want to go to Milan, I can go to Milan, I can go to Rome, but I'm going to live, you know, in Napoli or, you know, in, in another jurisdiction further to the South. It's all very nice. I can get a nice property and my tax rate is, is, is significantly lower than where it was before. And if I'm still drawing money from U.S. source or Canadian source, for example, I can have a lower lower rate of tax that they take before the Canadians send it over. And if I and I'll get a tax credit in Italy, so my, my global tax burden is significantly reduced, and I get to live in Italy. Um, so Italy, Greece, and Switzerland have a lump sum. Other jurisdictions, UK, Ireland, Malta, Cyprus, they have something called the remittance basis, which says you'll only pay tax on local source income, if you have any, and current year's income that you take into your hands. So for example, I moved to the United Kingdom at one point in my life. I had enough capital to cover my living expenses in the UK, and I didn't have any UK source income. So my tax bill to the UK was zero. And because I was non-resident in Canada, my tax bill to Canada was zero. There was nobody. There was no tax in jurisdiction. So gross equaled net. Now I had to have sufficient capital in order to, you know, pay living expenses for our family, which I happened to have. Um, I had sold a house in Canada and I got the principal residence exemption on that. So I had that capital put it into a bank account, which was a non-UK bank account. And I would have chose not to be a, I chose HSBC, but not in the UK or not in Canada. And I paid all my expenses there, drawing from the capital. I was earning money outside of the UK that was adding last year's income under the UK rules becomes next year's capital. So, so long as I had one year's worth of capital and no UK tax, I didn't have any tax anywhere. So it's wow. understanding these different jurisdictions and what works and doing it tax efficiently. So there's a number of jurisdictions that do that. Portugal, which is a popular destination for Americans and Canadians these days, um, they have something called a golden visa program, which they still have. And they will have, there are some, they're going to be making some changes, but you can still go there. Um, if you're going to go there and live there for more than six months of the year, you don't need to make a golden visa investment. So if you've got young children, like I do, uh, you're going to live there nine months of the year for a school year. You don't have to make a gold visa investment. If you're married to a European, you don't have to. Again, you may ha not have that Irish grandmother, but your spouse does. So she's going to be living there uh, on an Irish passport along with your kids on Irish passports. And you're going to be getting a Portuguese residence permit because you are the spouse of an EU country national. So it's being able to understand all those things. And, and Portugal says, well, we wanted to attract wealthy people or wealthy professional or, or high income professionals to our jurisdiction. So we created a regime where we'll give you a 10 year holiday. It's called the non-habitual tax resident. Why would they do that? Well, because when you buy a, a cappuccino, you're going to be paying VAT tax. Mm -hmm. You're going to be employing locals. You are going to, you know, and there's no additional marginal costs, not like they have to hire another policeman or pave another kilometer of roads because you and your family move there. So the marginal cost of having you there is negligible, but the benefits are significant. And the type of people who move there tend to be go-getters. I mean, Warren Buffett doesn't get up in the morning because he needs to cover his mortgage. It's part of his personality. So you put that type of personality with capital and sorry, uh, with capital, um, th then in your jurisdiction, you're at a minimum going to get VAT and you may very well get lots of other things. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So there's a combination of factors from what I'm, from what I'm gathering here. There's like, okay, obviously lifestyle, there's a tax, the stability of the country. What do you see most often? Do you see people leaving because they want a different lifestyle? 
or do you see people leaving because they want to save on the tax or is it a combination of both? You get, so you, you'll get everything from people saying, um, I'm worried about where I'm at right now, but I'm not ready to leave. So I kind of think of it as being in a wildfire zone. I know there's a wildfire zone. I've engaged in all the domestic tax planning and things. If I'm worried about crime, I've moved to a, a community or I've got a dog or a gun or whatever. So that's, we'll call that fire prevention. But they're getting this second citizenship, second residence is fire insurance. And they're getting, then, they, then they're then they saying, okay, well, if I perceive the fire is getting too close, whatever that concern is, whether it's taxation or whatever. Can we be, so I have a gonna, fire escape plan. Can I just jump in there? So if we're, are we talking about, let's just say Canada or the U.S., um, are we talking about the political environment? Are we talking, what are we talking about, gun laws? Uh, it's it, it's everybody has their own concern. So I have clients in the United States, for example, and, and in Canada across the political spectrum. So I have one group of clients who say, you know, who in November of 2024 in 18 short months, there's going to be an election. And they're sitting there saying, well, uh, if the Democrats hit the trifecta of POTUS and both houses of Congress, I'm looking at the Biden's green book of tax proposals. And, you know, if somebody tells you who they are, believe them and sit in there saying, okay, well, you know, capital gains are going to increase. The, the step up is going to be lost. All the normal domestic planning, like grants are going to change. And whether there's a wealth tax or they're going to tax unrealized capital gain, if the political winds blow that wildfire here, it's going to be pretty significant. So I better have fire insurance and a fire escape plan if I smell the smoke. Other clients are saying, I am, you know, Jewish, Muslim, Black, Asian, LGBTQ, whatever. I am seeing a, a Democrat or Republican. I'm being a, identifying as a group that somebody doesn't like. Mm -hmm. And I just am worried about the increase in political violence and, 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 and just, uh, you know, prejudice against a, a group that I'm a part of. Others are sitting there saying, I may be a gun owner, but I'm worried about these mass shooting events and impacting my children or my grandchildren. And yeah, statistically, they may not be part of a mass shooting event, but it, there's a hundred percent certainty that those kids are going to go through active shooter drills. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of stress. I know every time they go out the door to go with their friends to watch the new SpongeBob movie that they're going to, I'm going to be worried about, is this going to be the day? Every time I turn on the TV and I see a helicopter circling a school, who needs that anxiety? So mm -hmm. it's, everybody has their own motive or combination of motives. And so it's, so the, the, some clients will say, well, if it, this happened, I'm going to trigger, I got to use my fire insurance and I'm going to use my fire escape plan. Other clients say, well, I don't think that'll ever happen, but if it does, it's a good thing. And when I look at the the premium, the cost of getting that fire insurance and that fire escape plan, it's minimal compared to the damage, either to my fiscal house or to my family's well-being, if that wildfire comes. So it's really kind of an insurance policy, but it's an insurance policy that you also has some benefits. Like I said, the, the less brunt nieces and nephews of being able to do, do some things and expand horizons and investment opportunities. Hmm, really interesting. So, um, David, I want to thank you for being on our episode here today because I think I think the audience is going to get a ton of value from this. And I also um, believe that we're going to have you on again because it would be my pleasure. And and it would be be nice to get some feedback and some questions from from the audience that we can you know address you know what their major concerns are in the future. Oh, I think that's going to be important. I think we're going to get some people asking and, and getting very specifics as well into what they may be looking for and what the what the ramifications are, or even just you know, I'm always curious, and this this is something that I always think about at the back of my head is if you know, I at some point I yeah, I love Canada. I was born and raised here. I've been on you can say well, I lived in two different provinces, but on different sides of the country. Um, and I love it, but I've always thought about, you know, maybe it's time for a change. So I think there's a, more and more people that I talk to, especially after COVID, that are feeling this way. So I'm sure we're going to get a lot of feedback 
uh, in terms of questions here. So if someone is interested in having a, an insurance policy or taking a look at investing outside or becoming a, a citizen of another country or just planning or thinking about it, where can they go to find out more about you or even reach out to you directly? Well, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm also, I have a website to lesbronsassociates.com. And if they, there's a number of white papers that they may be interested in. There's a number of blogs there and, and media articles that'll give them kind of quite a bit of background and can kind of start shaping their minds. And then there, there's a contact form there if they wanted to, to reach out and either schedule a, a, a consultation or having a specific question about a jurisdiction. Um, they can do everything through the website or through LinkedIn. Okay, great. Well, I appreciate you being here. Thank you so much. Um, I hope you have an amazing day. And for those of you tuning in, we'll see you next time.